Well, we're joined now by Dame Andrea Jenkins, and it's wonderful to speak to you, Andrea. Many people will know you from that moment you took the seat from Ed Balls, that moment of fame, uh, or rather infamy for him. And you did come to represent something which we didn't then call the Red Wall, but we do now. Let me just start by asking you a little bit about Lee Anderson's defection. Are you tempted to join him? No, I'm not. I mean, to me, I won't be pushed out by um, the Liberals in our party who, because I feel it's decidedly and conservative at times. And as we've seen in recent years, I'm all party leaders come and go, but ultimately I'm a conservative and I'll stay being a conservative. It's interesting you talk about the Liberals in your parties because the nature of our politics and of our voting system is partly that every party has to contain coalitions. What is it do you think about modern politics that means it's getting harder and harder for parties to contain these coalitions. I mean, uh, yeah, Reform UK in some ways is the third rupture yes. on the right of the Tory party that we've seen in the past decade and a half. We had UKIP, we had Brexit mm. party, now we've seen Reform UK. Why do you think it is that your party at the moment isn't able to persuade the Lee Andersons of this world, you know, the people that are tempted by reform, that giving Conservatives a vote is their best chance of... Uh, fulfilling their dreams. I mean, I think there's apathy across the board. I mean, what I'm finding when I'm campaigning in my seat, um, as you said, it was one of the first red walls in um, 2015 when we didn't even know the red wall term existed. First brick in the red wall, if you like. Yes, absolutely. And so what I'm finding on the doorstep is really there's probably a third Conservative, third Labour, and a lot of undecided. And to me, it's a bit like a football team analogy. We've got lots of disappointed Tories out there, and they're not happy with their football team at the moment. But are they fully prepared to go over to another team? I think once we can start showing them that we are true Conservatives again, then I, I think we can get them back over. But look, I am a realist. It is last chance to loon territory here. I mean, I was on the Brexit campaign and I was the MP coordinator for the whole of Yorkshire, north, south, east and west. And it was amazing because people were saying to me at the time, Amal, that they was going out to vote for the first time in their lives. They felt that there was something that they could vote for, that, that um, they really had a voice. And I think with the shenanigans in Parliament, um, we've seen, obviously, in certain quarters, the media tr um, trying to stop us, um, you know, having Brexit, not being pro-Brexit, even though the country voted for it, and the shenanigans in Parliament trying to stop it. I think that switched voters off. I think that was one of the first moments then we got this stonking majority through Boris. Then we saw what happened then within my own party. So people feel disillusioned because they've ended up with a party leader who they didn't vote for in 2019. And I know in my own constituency, I've lost half of my party members um, since Rishi's become prime minister because they are disillusioned because it, he isn't what they voted for. The point you just made is a really interesting one because it was often said of Gordon Brown many years ago that what he lacked, because he'd never been to a general election as prime minister, mm -hmm. was a kind of emotional contract with the people. He yes. was never able to connect by going out to them and saying, vote for me and then getting that stonking mandate. To what extent do you think is Rishi Sunak like, hampered amongst the public by the fact that he doesn't have yeah, an emotional contract with the people because they've never had a chance to vote for him in an election, which is not necessarily his fault. I, I, I think you've hit the nail on the head. Um, that's certainly an element of it, Amal. Um, because, yeah, that emotional contract. And also, I think the way that Boris was ousted and because Rishi was the first major person in government to resign, I don't think our voters have forgotten that. So they feel, so to speak, that he's is partly responsible for Boris's downfall. So I think it's got that element. But you're right, that 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 social contract is, is so important, is it, um, with democracy. You've been very frank about the problems that you're facing on the doorstep. Just give us in that same spirit, please, a sense, the, the mood among MPs. You know, as, as journalists, as members of the public, we occasionally see these little snapshots of what's on WhatsApp threads and you see these off-the-record briefings. Just tell, just tell us honestly, what's the feeling among MPs in this week mm. when... Lee Anderson has defected to reform, the polls aren't uh, where you want them to be, and yes. you're not able to talk about the issues that you really want to be able to focus on because there's all these other things uh, erupting. Among M amongst MPs, I mean, we are back to those Theresa May days, aren't we? Do you remember the never-ending Groundhog Day where Brexit means Brexit, etc., and bring in the withdrawal agreement back about five times? And the lack of motivation among MPs and looking how can we break this cycle... We're in that situation now, but, but sadly it's worse. Because we've had 
several party leaders, um, I'll put it as diplomatically as I can, over the last few years. I think some MPs feel a bit rabbit in the headlights. They feel a bit stranded. You know, what can we do? It's not a good situation for any party to be in, and I don't think any, any MP would necessarily choose this route. But you've got some there who have given up, some who are just don't know what to do, feel stuck. And you've got another quarter who are out there fighting. I mean, I'm, I'm fighting for the heart of our party and, and I want to save our country from the socialist level. Um, do, you, do you get the sense when you are kind of looking for those answers and the rabbits in the headlights, mm. do you get the sense that from the centre, from the number 10 operation, from the people around the Prime Minister, that you are getting a clear sense of A, grip, and B, a clear sense of energy that there is a plan to turn your party's fortunes around? Do you get that kind of leadership? I think the trying. Uh, without a doubt, the trying. I mean, with the PM making this speech about the policing and the issues on the streets. So I do think they're trying, but it's actions speak louder than words. We need to see that boats stop coming over uh, in droves as they are at the moment um, and that we can send these flights to Rwanda. Your actions speak louder than words. And I think until we start seeing that, we're not going to necessarily get the confidence in the public. You sound um, like it's tough. And I don't mean that as an insult, by the way. We know and we, 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 you know, the life of an MP is tough. And we've seen some of the, let's be frank, disgusting abuse that you guys have to endure on a daily well, I only basis. I got one um, last week saying for my six-year-old to be raped and for us all be at, both be attacked by Hamas. And we know where you live, so I got a pretty bad one last week, actually. I nearly quit because of that one. What? Where, where was that? Um, I got an email. Um, it was very explicit. So the police are investigating that at the moment. But, I mean, I, I've had, like nine death threats over the years um i have cctv on my home i've had people rip my gates down so it's um yeah it this is the only time i've wanted to quit because they've gone after my little one you know being a tiger mum i mean as any parent you know we were there to protect our children but um yeah so i mean we're going off at tangents now but is it is it worth it andrew being an mp um getting an email like that uh Grab I mean, it in the headlights. You know, you're under huge. You know, you're under huge pressure to try. I mean, it's a it's a great privilege, and I I love being an MP. When you get constituents coming to you in surgeries, it's worth it. Definitely, I'm honest. Definitely worth it. When you think about the coalition that yeah. Boris Johnson was able to put together in 2019, it does seem now to be, given the current situation your party is in, does seem to be quite an achievement. He got people from mm. uh, across the political spectrum to get behind him in 2019, give him a majority. He had that um, slogan of get Brexit done. Mm. Would he be an asset to your party in a future election? Would it be useful to you if Mr Johnson were out campaigning in your seat? Boris, look, he's still got that stardust. I mean, even in my red wall seat, going back to as we started this conversation, people still come up to me to this day saying, we wish Boris was prime minister. I think that's amazing. But I'm an optimist as well, Emil. I mean, we've been here before. Yes, maybe not as bad as this. Um, and we've seen the, look, the Labour Party, look what they went through under Corbyn, etc. So it does seem that cycles of parties. But I do think that we, we can't give up hope if we get more Conservative policies. I mean, ideally, I personally want a new leader um, then before the election and start delivering on our manifesto commitments. Then these disaffected voters, which we are seeing in the polling, I do think we can bring them back. I really appreciate your frankness and honesty. You've talked about wanting a new leader. Is there a kind of gathering feeling amongst some of your fellow MPs that you ought to try to get a new leader before you go into another general election? Are these among some, definitely. Um, but I, like I said, there's a, a large chunk where they are the rabbit in the headlights and they feel a bit like they can't move. What, what should the next move be? So I think there's a big chunk like that, really, which um, they're unsure what to do next. Dame Andrew Jenkins, thank you so much for speaking to us. Thank you very much. Thank you.